I wanted to celebrate three Dutch people who have not been mentioned during the whole of today. It, I find it extraordinary. Janneke Horn is a Dutch neurologist who did one of the first systematic reviews of animal studies that I'm aware of, 10 years ago. Now, how did she come to do it with her colleagues there? Well, they are part of the Cochrane Collaboration and the Cochrane Stroke Group. And they had done a uh, systematic review of nemodipine, a calcium antagonist, in stroke, acute extremely stroke. And I think 7,500 patients had participated in human trials. And they were unable to, to detect any beneficial effect of this drug. So they went on to ask the question, so that, that was done during the 90s. They went on to ask the question, well, what did the animal data show? So they did a systematic review of the animal studies. And there again, they failed to find any beneficial effect of the drug in the animal model. And indeed, they found that animal studies were still being done after 7,000 patients had participated in the human studies, which raises really important questions about why patients are being wasted, why animals are being wasted. So this is a very, very important um, uh, study, and I urge you to name a street after Janneke Horn or something like that. I mean, she deserves it. Now, the other respect in which we are, we in Britain, and the world indeed, is grateful to you Dutch people, is in relation to this study. It's been referred to twice already today, TGN 1412. And it's had disastrous effects in six volunteers, uh, one or two of which had really nasty um, uh, fingers and toes fell off. But possibly their um, uh, immunocompetence had been affected for the rest of their lives with this drug. Now, why are we indebted to um, Dutch people in some senses after the event? Well, it was because after the trial had been done and the results shown, these two people, Cohen and Kenter, some of you will probably know, did what should have been done before the trial was done. They did a systematic review of the evidence and they said, it could have been predicted that this was going to be a disaster. So I just wanted to remind you Dutch people how much you have to be proud of in this uh, field and how much more you have to be proud of for having convened this meeting. It's very, very important. You've got more people here than we had at the first colloquium, the Cochrane Collaboration, which was October um, 2003. And I wish you well. I'll come back to that, but I want to make a few remarks. What I'm not going to try to do is to pick out on any particular presentations. I think we've had a feast of good presentations today. So I'm not going to single out any of them to um, give them particular attention, but I want to draw points which I think, and hope anyway, uh, you'll feel draw on the lessons that we've been exposed to today. The way that I put the first one is, if you went outside on, into the street and you asked a sample of people from the general public, you asked them two questions. Do you think researchers should find out what's known already before doing additional research? They would probably give you a very funny look. and say, what do you mean? <laughs> it's bloody obvious they should look at what's known already. And then if you ask them, do you think, having done the research, they should publish it? Well, of course they should publish it. So it's, if you ask normal people, I'm talking about people who aren't members of the scientific community, who regard themselves as super normal, if you ask normal people these two rather straightforward questions, they would have no difficulty in giving you an answer very quickly. So we'll know when there is opposition to the notion of systematic reviews in, in um, 
in certain scientific communities, when they can actually persuade themselves that the answer to those questions is yes, we know then we will have made some progress. Now, the Cochrane collaboration, when it started, and it started after there had already been quite a lot of systematic reviews done, well, in medicine they started in the 70s, actually, although it was the American social scientists who led the way. Methodologically, the American social scientists deserve most of the credit for developing ways of thinking about information synthesis, research synthesis. Um, so in medicine, it started in the 70s, started to get underway during the 80s. The Cochrane Collaboration wasn't um, uh, founded until 1993. And by that time, there were quite a lot of senior medical people who had been involved in these studies, in systematic reviews. So although there was opposition to these ideas, there was sufficient support from very senior scientists. And I'd probably single out the neurologist in particular, because the neurologists are, the, within medicine anyway, the intellectual aristocracy. If they say that something is worth doing, people will listen, and it's going to be extremely difficult to dismiss it. But that doesn't alter the fact, and I'll give you an anecdote in a moment, um, that there was evidence um, from uh, some people that they thought this was some sort of new fad. What do you mean you're telling us that we're not actually using evidence in our research or in our practice? Outrageously cheeky suggests that we're not doing right by the public. And indeed, that is the case. The research community is giving very bad value for the community's investment in research. A friend, Paul Glasio and I published a paper in The Lancet in 2009 with the title, Avoidable Waste in Preparing and Reporting and Doing Research. We estimated that 85% of the estimated $100 billion a year that's invested in research is wasted. $85 billion a year wasted. Partly because people don't find out what's known already and do redundant research. Partly because half of the clinical trials don't get published. Probably even worse in animal research. And that's one of the important things is that we need the kind of evidence that has been shown to us today to persuade people that it's not right to be complacent with this situation. It's not fair to the public who pay for us researchers to have fun. Because we have, in general, very enjoyable do uh, uh, jobs which are pretty well played. I'll give you the, this is the anecdote. A um, couple of years ago, I was asked if I would chair a research strategy committee for the Multiple Sclerosis Society of England. And I had to think about this quite carefully because I know virtually nothing about um, multiple sclerosis. I knew that it was an important um, condition. It affects very large numbers of people, actually. I don't know if it's the most common neurological disease uh, apart from stroke, but uh, it, it's um, a very important disease, chronic. Um, and so I set certain conditions. Uh, I said, I want to have a lay co-chair to keep my feet on the ground. I want to make sure that everything is published. I want to make sure that conflicts of interest are made absolutely explicit. But I also said, I want to make sure nothing additional is funded unless there are systematic reviews. And I sent around some of my papers. The, the committee had already been chosen. I was just asked to, be, to chair it. Um, so I sent them some things that I'd written. I said, look, if anyone's got any hesitations about any of these conditions that I'm setting, or the sort of way that I present the rationale for them, don't worry, I won't be offended. I've got plenty of things to do. But they accepted it. First meeting, there was a physiologist there. And I think he's a physiologist, isn't he, Julian Jack? Yeah, clinical physiologist. 
And so I said, I just wanted to check that these um, conditions that I had set for being co-chair of this um, committee were acceptable to everyone. He blew a gasket. I don't know if you know what that means, but it's when steam starts coming out of, uh, from under the bonnet of the car. Um, he was absolutely furious that I should suggest that that should be a routine um, way of looking at the justification for new research. And he resigned from the committee, and he wrote to the chief executive, said, said that the committee was not fit for purpose and that we would uh, uh, learn the error of our ways. I was a little bit shaken, as you can imagine. Uh, I'd tried to sort of prepare the ground. And how did I actually um, sort of get around the situation? Well, I asked Malcolm to come to speak to the committee. <laughs> there again, there was this sort of um, Zen master uh, <laughs> effect. <laughs> he wrote a, um, a policy paper for the, the society basically setting out that principle. He was then commissioned to do some of the systematic reviews to choose potential candidate drugs which are way out of patent. No one was going to make any money out of them at all, but the animal research suggested that they ought to be taken sufficiently seriously, and that's now moving forward. But I say that because it's, it is going to be a struggle that some of you will have to get this message across. But if you stick to the idea that the public understands this, even if you're finding it difficult, the public understand the principle, and when you start looking at the data which have been presented to us today, you really can't ignore it unless you want to be judged as being impossibly arrogant and complacent with the status quo. So for example, if you think the empirical evidence of poor quality research doesn't actually apply to your particular stratum of research, show it. Bring us some good news. Show us that, in fact, the things that are coming up from all over the place suggesting that the quality of animal research is lousy actually don't apply to your particular um, sub-branch uh, sub of animal research. It would be fantastic to have some models to, to turn to and acknowledge the possibility, or perhaps even the probability, that this poor quality is manifested in the very disappointing um, production of really important new discoveries, treatment discoveries. You know, sort of golden age of, of discoveries of important treatments, let's say between the 40s and the 70s, something like that. Since then, it's actually been, given the amount of investment that's gone into this, it's been a very poor return on investment. Could it be that this is a reflection of the lousy research? And acknowledge the fact that this has consequences for human beings, this lousy quality of research. People embark on human studies without, I would say, uh, nearly enough animals having been studied to get robust basis for going to an ethics committee saying, we need to use this in human beings. And if, if that's going to happen, there will have to be greater humility, less arrogance among some of our research community. And that's why the support of people like your minister, terribly disappointing to me that everyone looks so young these days, <laughs> um, to your minister and um, uh, other people who are outside the research community, who are in principle supportive of um, uh, science, realize that science has delivered great things in many respects, but there's still plenty of room for improvement. So I hope that you go forward from this meeting to have gradual, because it almost certainly will be gradual, success in shaping people's views. You'll probably find, maybe it'll take 10 years, but you'll probably find there'll be a point where there's a sort of tipping point where some of the animal researchers will say, if I don't get onto this boat pretty quickly, I'm going to look as if I'm part of the, sort of the past century because it's so obviously a sensible way of improving the way that we work. 
The one way I suggested to Marlies that you might like to think of, we did it in the Cochrane collaboration, think of a dead person after whom you could name your initiative. It's always good to, you know, dead people can't complain that their name's being used, but if you can, if you can think of someone who is sufficiently well regarded uh, as a pioneer around the world for having been an extremely diligent animal researcher, think about using that person's name as a way of um, drawing people in to something which, if, if the person is generally respected, it's going, to be fu it's going to be very difficult for even the most arrogant people to say, should have called it after me, actually, because I've been thinking this all along. Thank you very much. <laughs>